At least for a few more weeks. In studio with me is Colonel O'Donnell, head of the Rhode Island State Police. Good morning, Colonel. Good morning. How many more weeks? Two weeks from today. Oh, you're counting it down. You're a short timer. I am. Now, today you look like an anchor man. No, you didn't no. come in with the uniform. What are you looking for my job now? What's no, no. It's uh, <laughs> that's the time to pass that baton. Yeah, I'll I'll be in uniform a few more times. We have some ceremonial things to do, nine eleven things like that. Right. When you leave, what can you keep with the uniform? Of your badge as a commemorative, what do you get to keep when you leave? Nothing. Turn everything in. It's state's property. We never take anything with us. Nothing at all. The badges you keep are yours because you buy them when you become a trooper. Right. And we don't have badges uh, that we wear on our uniforms. Oh, that's right. You have the numbers. We have numbers. I uh, no, ba- uh, Excuse me. Our uniform is unique, so we get we're given badges. They go in your wallet, so for identification purposes, or on your hip if you're a detective, or if you're in plain clothes. All right. But the number that you wear and uh, that you've worn for a long time. What is your number, by the way? Was it one? Yeah. The badge numbers are one through twelve. Yeah. We're actually now one through fourteen. The command staff. And then all the other badges are given to you when you become a trooper, and that's your badge until you make the command staff or you retire at that badge. So for me, I was 156, and then any position the command staff, that number, right. and, and, and that what you end up retiring at. You don't get to keep the boots? Those are handmade. Nothing. No, they go back. And <laughs> the, good, the funny part is um, not too many people are after my boots and my shoes because yeah. they're all too big to wear my size. But it's, Those are big shoes to fill. No, I wouldn't say that. But it's a commodity. Uh, state police uniform is something that's... Pretty special. All right. What? But why? Why now? Why the decision? And by the way, you said it was a well kept secret. You thought it would get out. Well, you know the politics of the world talking about it. So I think I mentioned to you about a month ago. Well, how do I explain this? In the course of your career, I talk to people that I'm friends with locally, and the colonels from New England are very close. The colonels in the Eastern Seaboard are very close. I sit on many national committees, some homeless security advisors, so I'm around the country quite a bit. And we all talk about, you know, when, and everybody says, you'll just know. And you wake up someday and you just know. So about a month ago, I wouldn't say I just woke up, but you know, you hit the speed bumps in your life, and I'm like, I felt like I go at 100 miles an hour, and I've been going 100 miles an hour since I was probably born. Right. And I felt like I dropped to like 95. And I saw it, I felt it, which you might think 95 is pretty good. But I thought maybe. So I thought about it, and and when I thought about it, that made me think if the, if I'm thinking about it, that might be the time. So I went and spoke to the governor about it. Uh, she didn't agree with me. She said, it's, you know, it's your decision, obviously, but no. Mm-hmm. I talked to the most important people is my wife and my children, and they're just like me. And so I'm uh, smart enough to know that I admire and adore the state police, but I also understand that most people say it is someday for you. So I thought about it, and I didn't want to then go out and put my name out in the job market, because mm-hmm. if I did, then that trickles out, and that trickles down to our troops. And if you know anything about the culture of the state police, they would feel that, hey, you know, he wants to leave us. And I didn't want to do that. So that's the typical track we all take when we have to. Yeah. But, you know, my term is unlimited. I serve at the pleasure of any governor. So I decided that I'd do it that way. And then I'd go look for a job. You're in your mid-50s, right? I'm 56. 56. So there's a, you have a long way to go. Then retirement is really just from the state police. Are you looking to do something else? I know you're involved with the high school coaching and lacrosse and things like that. Yeah, I'm not sure because I really didn't give it a lot of thought what I wanted to do because I have a... Uh, a very unique, I think, skill set portfolio. So I really don't know. I have a lot of different things. I do coach and um, I do teach. I've been an adjunct instructor at Roger. I'm sorry, at Salve for the last 20 years, and I have been as uh, an instructor at Roger Williams for about 20 years. So I really don't know. I have to give it some thought, right. um, but I'll take some time to think about it. And um, everyone, you have to work. Well, I've been working for since I was 16 years old. I didn't know you were a correctional officer. I was. That was my first professional career. And then, too? I was actually the lacrosse coach at Providence College for four years. I was head coach there. While I was doing that, I was a correctional officer, local police officer, and then I became a state trooper. And when I became a state trooper, the coaching had to stop because it just interfered too much with being a young trooper. And then in between, before you became back to be the colonel, you were the U.S. Marshal. Yes, I federal 20, level. Yeah, I retired as second command of Lieutenant Colonel of State Police. Yep. I became the U.S. Marshal for the District of Rhode Island. That's a presidential appointment by President o- yep. Obama, and that was done through Senator Jack Reed. And then um, Governor Chafee me, asked, me, asked me if I would come back to the State Police, and I thought about it, you know, the financial implications with that. But if you know anything about the men and the women of the State Police, um, I, don't, I think anybody else would make the same decision. All right. So I assume, uh, well, in the mix would be more teaching. You'd be a professor. You can uh, teach in an academy. You can become a consultant. You can go to work for a private security. You can do a lot of things. All those in the mix? 
Yeah, no, I'm not sure because I think everybody kind of pigeonholes cops, so to speak, or police into security, those type of things. I think the world's changed so much. There's so much out there that you have skill sets for, you know, homeland security issues, cyber. Even though I'm not a cyber expert, I have a pretty good handle on all those things. So um, to tell you to define right. it, I don't know, and it'll I'll find out soon enough. Now, I know if I say greatest accomplishment, you would say, well, leading the men and women that are on state police. I know you got a little emotional last night because you look at that building. It's been your home for a long time, even the new one. Uh, you've been there for quite some time, but if I say, well, what was the top? What was the what was the biggest arrest you made? What was the biggest case you had? What's the thing you're most proud of? You would say what? I get asked that yesterday, and the biggest accomplishment is I'm married and I have three kids. And they say that has nothing to do with the job. Well, it does, because in the business that I did, in the underbelly of the world that I lived mm -hmm. in, you don't survive marriages and you have dysfunctional kids. Couldn't be completely opposite. I have a great wife and I have great children. How so old that, are your children, by the way? 25, 23, and 21. And well, one's in, two are in college. One's a, a, a state trooper, or one's a senior at Bryant, and one's a junior at Tufts. Okay. But if I asked you professionally, as a colonel, you, I, I oversaw this case, and that's going to be the one that I remember. What would you say? It's, it's hard to say that because I thought about it after I was asked yesterday. Yeah. I've racked my brains, and it'd probably be what unfair. What I would like to think is the totality of what the men and women of the state police have done over the years. From my perspective, being young and helping and being a part of helping eradicate that the traditional La Cosa Nostra, they're still around, but they're a shell of who they are. You know, we still read about cases right. and things we're doing. And just being a part of that, and the people I worked with from the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Attorney General's Office, troopers, local police, that really, because when you have those bonds, you never have those bonds right. again when you're in the trenches working with those people. So going after the mafia, you would you would say, well, that's a big part of your career. You were undercover at one point, and you have all the knowledge in your head. You know who's who and everything. Yeah, I wouldn't say I have all the knowledge, but I have um, a detailed knowledge. I worked undercover for six years, so I dealt with the, um, the underbelly of society from 1990 to right. 1996. And it was... It was a, just really interesting. What I learned much more than about wise guys was the underbelly of how they get things done in the system. Right. And I don't mean just their system, how they infiltrate state government, local governments, and how they scam. And then it teaches you about other things. And so it's six years, and you probably get a 20-year experience right smack in the middle how they operate. And I think that was helpful f to me as a colonel, really, to understand all the complexities that come at you. Because the state police superintendent position, in my opinion, is people think, what a great job. Well, it's a great job, great uniform. But from my perspective, I put in some serious hours. We have really good leaders in the state police. And the place is in good hands. I think you should know that. A great gr young leaders that really understand what we're trying to do. Um, I'll give them any wisdom, I think. But I also understand when I leave that I've left. And I think it's important for the uh, um, superintendents or any agency to know when you're out, you're out. And I certainly will take any advice they ask of me. Yep. But I'll step aside and let them thrive in their own leadership style. Now, the song goes, Regrets, I've had a few. Any unfinished business, anything? Well, I wish I would have got a handle on that. Do you leave looking back at, at anything? Well, you always feel bad. Could you do more? And yes, and um, one of the things I feel really deeply about besides leaving something you love is this. We have this massive, I don't know better words, community outreach that we do. And we've been able to bring young troopers, older troopers, and myself into the community and build relationships. And it's based on trust. And trust is based on time. I can walk in the community and say, we're this, we're that. It doesn't matter until you're there. And I talked to several community leaders yesterday and uh, they, they're just outstanding. If people really knew mm -hmm. what really happened with the police in the community and it has really, it has a little to do with one issue. It's recruiting it's helping stem the violence everybody one of the community leaders said to me the other day he said colonel it's working i said what do you mean because a gangbanger approached him and said his name's kobe he said kobe uh, i respect what you're doing and the message there is that even the people that sometimes go or follow the law understanding that everybody's making this major effort to communicate talk to each other because that's a new wave of 21st century policing that we all have to do and some of me still wants mm -hmm. to do that by leaving i've lost that bully pulpit for them and i recognize uh, but as a retired colonel i have the same juice to help them but I will certainly I've committed to them being the community I believe in it with my core I grew up in Providence so I kind of understand it better than most all right 850 we'll take a quick break and then wrap up 
All right, right back. A couple more minutes with uh, Colonel O'Donnell, who's going to be leaving us in two weeks. You go the paperwork's in? You file the paperwork and everything. What do you do? You tell them. What do you do? No, that's a good point. You go to um, our human resource person, brings my paperwork to the retirement system. They calculate what your pension benefit, all the things that you have coming to you, put notice in, and then you get put into the pension system. Now, your son, you said, is a trooper? My oldest son is, Are yes. you happy? Sometimes people are unhappy that people follow in their footsteps. Are you pleased with that? It's a dangerous job. You know, when it first started, no. I didn't think I wanted my sons in this business because I have a probably a greater understanding most of what it's really all about right. and I don't mean that in a bad way I love the state police I love police but as a father you know but that's what he wanted to do since a young kid and um, as my dad said just follow what you want so he was uncomfortable candidly because he was in the state police pick for the class and I wasn't on the state police so he's been on the job five years that's what he likes to do I think he'll be better off now better than I'm not here because yeah. the the difficulty of being That'd be a little tough having yeah. your father as the boss. Yeah, I never deal with him. He's so far removed from me, right. but it's probably uncomfortable for him. And it's uncomfortable people around him. So I think he'll be better off uh, on his own now. What do you think when you see all this news about uh, certain parts of the community going after cops? A lot of criticism of police officers. It, there's different words to describe it. I think it's unfair, certainly unfair. Uh, the police officers are the most vilified profession in America, in my opinion. You have to be right 100% of the time. There's no other business, including doctors, who are mm -hmm. much more educated than police. The police do a job with people that people are running away from. So I think the benefit of the doubt should always go to the police. I think you understand when you see videos and things that are going wrong. Um, I hope it never happens here. I think you've got a really good group of police officers here. You've got community leaders that believe in everybody. But it's a long in the process. So I think it's unfair. I think there's a rush to judgment. I think when you see it on video, something happens, and that's what happened. And the video is not always the whole story. And then when the whole story comes out, it might be a two or three months later. And it doesn't matter because that's what the video. So I think as the future goes, Ferguson's the best example. The police should have put their story out right away the best they can this is what happened and if it's wrong then you hold people accountable for it but you got to tell your story if not and this is no disrespect from the media the media will fill that void so you have to tell them and I've learned that from people like you that tell us and I hear it all the time just mm -hmm. tell us as soon as you tell you then at least your version of the story is out to the best of your ability all right I gotta run wish we had more time but congratulations really on behalf of all Rhode Islanders listening to you this morning thank you very much have a great rest of the uh, rest of the week and two more weeks thank you all right Colonel Colonel O'Donnell, Rhode Island State Police.